Hello, welcome back to Aspects of Archaeology. Today we're going to be looking at a dating technique called thermoluminescence. Ah, yes, I once owned a pair of luminescent thermals, or thermoluminaire as they're called in France. No, no, not luminescent thermals, thermoluminescence. This dating technique uh, depends upon a very specific process. This dating technique depends upon radiation, but don't worry, we're not talking about the superhero-inducing stuff, rather normal background radiation found in the natural environment. Specifically, low levels of radiation given off by radioactive elements, such as uranium, thorium, and also the radioactive version of potassium. Thermoluminescent dating depends upon a reaction between this radiation, certain materials, and crystalline formations. For example, in a material such as a block of clay, background radiation will have an effect upon its atoms. Ionizing radiation has the potential to dislodge and expel electrons from atoms within the block of clay. Some of these electrons are then caught within crystalline imperfections within the block of clay, effectively imprisoning them. The number of electrons imprisoned within the clay will continue to rise through time. These can only be released by heat. More often than not, this heat comes in the form of fire, and in the case of clay, usually occurs when a pot is fired in the kiln. At this moment, all of the electrons are effectively released from their crystalline prisons. Imperceptible to the human eye, they escape in the form of light. This process is termed bleaching. The prisons are emptied, and from this point onwards, the concentration begins to build up once more, until eventually it is excavated in the form of a broken pottery sherd on an archaeological site. When a sample is taken and rapidly heated, it is possible to measure the energy or light emitted, and thereby gain an estimate for when the pot was last exposed to heat. So, archaeologists, being the clever sort we are, have been able to apply this observation to archaeology and use it as a way to date certain objects. Archaeologists frequently excavate artefacts which can be dated using thermoluminescence. After all, fire and humanity have gone hand in hand for almost as long as we have existed. This is particularly true when it comes to sites such as pottery kilns. If it's of a geological origin, has crystalline imperfections, and has been exposed to heat, it can be dated, so pottery can most certainly be dated. So too can stone tools exposed to fire during their lifetime. This technique even has a reliable range which is more than double that of carbon dating. However, we must take a moment to acknowledge some of the limitations of thermoluminescence. Radiation permeates objects and environments with varying rates of success. So, for example, an object found underwater will accumulate electrons far more slowly than an object found on dry land. Also, radiation can be emitted from elements found within the pottery itself so very careful measurements must be taken from all potential sources of radiation. It's also better if an object is found within a uniform environment, i.e. in the centre of a context where the dose will be more stable than on the edge of the context. You must also be aware of how frequently the object may have been bleached. A pot, for example, may be bleached when it's used for cooking. And also, thermoluminescent dates often have a margin of error of up to 10%. However, well-trained technicians are accustomed to accommodating these variables, and thermoluminescence has proved itself an invaluable technique for dating archaeological sites from around the world. Despite those limitations, thermoluminescence has been used across the world for dating various objects with extremely useful results. Between 300,000 and 30,000 years ago, Neanderthals living in Europe were making and creating stone tools known as the Mousterian industry. Sometimes known as the Lavalois technique, these distinctive tools were used for many tasks. If through cooking or an accident a stone tool was exposed to burning, it can be dated using thermoluminescence, and indeed just such tools have been used to date Neanderthal sites. The so-called Nok culture is one of West Africa's earliest known civilizations. In 1943, British archaeologist Bernard Fagg came into possession of a terracotta head from the region. He employed thermoluminescence to date the head to around 500 BC, thus giving a date to what had hitherto been a fairly mysterious culture. 
and of course thermoluminescent dating has been used to date pottery from the Neolithic and the Bronze Age, and can be used to complement or confirm existing radiocarbon dates. However, in the case of Abu Balas in the northern Egyptian desert, thermoluminescent dates exposed a heritage not previously suspected. Here, what had previously been considered a minor water depot for Tibu raiders was pushed back to 1500 BC. It became evidence for an extensive trade network traversing the desert in the time of the pharaohs. And thermoluminescence has even been used to date sediments from different strata. Usually from occupation layers, these different sediments do after all contain everything required for thermoluminescent dating. The sun itself provides the heat. So thermoluminescence is a technique which has been used across the world to great effect. It helps to uh, confirm existing radiocarbon dates. It helps us to reach beyond the limits of radiocarbon. And also as well, it helps us to gain an impression of when something was made um, in a time frame which often in the past we haven't really been able to tie it down. It allows us to take into account the margin of error and try and uh, place things into a relative timeline with much more accuracy and therefore uh, gain a deeper understanding of our history. So thermoluminescent dating is a most welcome addition to the archaeologist's toolkit. So that's been thermoluminescent dating. Now you may notice I'm wearing my Wales rugby top today. And this is because it is the third place playoff in the Rugby World Cup. Aren't I good to you? I made this video even though I have very serious duties to be attending to. So, uh, feel grateful. <laughs> Nonetheless, thank you very much for watching. Hopefully you found this video interesting or useful. Feel free to comment below or send me any questions you might have. Of course, please do subscribe by pushing the button above. Uh, alternatively, you can follow us on Facebook just by searching for Archeosoup Productions and clicking like. And actually as well, if you're a Twitter maniac, uh, anything that appears on the Facebook page is being tweeted concurrently. So um, I now cater for both of you social social networkites, as it were. Um, so until next time, thank you very much for watching.